I shall also just let me just turn my camera off so we can save a bit of bandwidth. Right then, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to, to this talk on <coughs> fish and uh, how to identify them on the riverbank. Um, thank you to the FSC and to Dan and, and, and for Kieran for, uh, for inviting me and for, for putting this on this afternoon. Um, this is a whistle stop tour of um, fish of the uh, riverbank. Oh, one second. So, yeah, just to, uh, to introduce myself, my name is Paul Coulson. <coughs> Excuse me, and I'm the uh, Director of Operations for the Institute of Fisheries Management. We are uh, a professional membership body made up of fishery boards from right across the sector, from academics to, uh, to students, to field scientists, to, to people with an interest in, um, in fish and fisheries. Uh, and we say we've got members right across the board from the freshwater through to the marine. So we're a really uh, varied bunch. Um, we do a lot of sort of events. We do a lot of training courses. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about fish and fisheries, then uh, I will uh, give you a bit more information about that at the end. Um, and I'm also an angler, um, a mad keen angler, not as much uh, as keen as I used to be, unfortunately, with work and family pressure. And but I do occasionally get out on the river about myself and, and catch the odd fish. Um, so that's me. And then as well in, in my sort of spare time, I'm the chairman of the East Yorkshire Rivers Trust and I'm also the freshwater specialist for the British Record Fish Committee so I do a, I do a bit of a fishery um, work here and there as well. So what are we going to talk about today? So I'm going to start off with just a little bit of background looking at the uh, some of the groups of fish then we're going to move on to some of the sort of the key features and then I've sort of broken the fish down the fish themselves down into three distinct groups so the, sort of the more common fish the everyday fish that you might see and some of the uh, the migratory fish species that we've got in the UK and then to finish off the uh, uh, I've sort of grouped them as the oddities the the, the the bits and pieces that we 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 come across quite you know uh, pretty rare but do do throw you every now and again and there's some some beauties in there I'm, I'm sure you'll uh, you'll appreciate them when we get to we get to them <coughs> so um where are we so freshwater fish there are around 50 species of fish found in, uh, in the British Isles that live some or all of their lives in, in fresh waters. Some people will say there's 51, 52, 53. We'll just round it up to, to 50. There, there, there may well be you know, a, a couple more than that. And again, we are, we, we've got about 41 of these that we, we actually class as, as native. Um, and then that, the rest of that number is made up with so some of these non-native species that have become more common uh, species, such as the common carp, we've got Wells catfish, we've got off, and we've got a few um, non-native species, uh, so invasive na non-native species as well in there. Now things like the sunbleak, the topmouth gudgeon, uh, uh, which we're, we're going to touch on later on. And, and as you can see from this FSC field guide, so there's a, a nice plug for you there, Dan, um, they all look pretty similar. So what we need to do is, is look at the ways we can, we can classify them uh, and start to break them down so we can... Um, we can identify some of these um, these individual species. So just to, to really to the first thing we could do is we could split them off into two separate groups. So we, we have our our coarse fish and we have our salmonids. Uh, and generally the, the, the bulk of, um, of species in the UK are, are, are coarse fish. Um, and the, the, the reason for them to be <clears throat> to be grouped as, as coarse fish is a couple of reasons. So some of them developed spawning tubercles at mating time, which led to them sort of actually being called, re referred to as coarse or rough fish. Um, and it actually, the, the coarse fish classification goes right back to Victorian times. And it was a way for them to, to describe or to, to split off those fish that were deemed good enough to eat, which they thought were the salmonids and everything else. Um, so the salmonids, the, the sort of the, the, uh, the, should we refer them as the posh edible fish? And then the, the, the coarse fish, which was, was everything else, which wasn't quite right for eating, which if you'd have gone back a few of my years, we would have eaten coarse fish quite happily. And, and, and you, you know, indeed, many people still do. Certainly coarse fish, most common group of fish, particularly for the sport of angling in England. And these are the fish you'll find in, in most habitat types uh, uh, and the ones that you most commonly come across when you're out there in the field doing some of, it, uh, some of your work and some of your monitoring. And they vary markedly in size. And we'll, we'll come back to look at that in a second. And then the other group of fish is your salmonids, you know, salmon, trout um, and, and, and sea trout and, and the grayling. 
And if you followed anything that's gone on over the past few years, you'll know that, that the Salmonids are in a bit of a, a powerless state, particularly the salmon. Um, they're definitely having a, a, a bit of a, a few issues linked to a whole host of things, climate change, we've got barriers to migration, we've got changes in, in, in ocean rates and temperature, and we've got impacts of things like salmon farming on them as well. Uh, and so they've got a very limited range, which is, is certainly decreasing, but they are a, a critically important species for, for angling tourism, particularly in areas like Wales and Scotland. Um, and I think you can actually look at some of the studies uh, if you look at some of the, the, the value of, a, of one salmon to, to tourism in places like Wales and Scotland, it is really quite, um, quite high. So, and on the back of that, they are certainly an iconic species that most people know. We've all seen pictures of salmon jumping at weirs. And uh, I'm sure the majority of you are also aware of their, their unique life cycle, which is, uh, which is pretty impressive. And again, we'll, we'll come back to that later on. So the, the, most, the co most common group that we're likely to come across is this, this coarse fish. Um, broken down into the, into the distinct family groups. Uh, and this group in, in uh, the UK includes the cyprinids, which is actually the largest and the most diverse family of fish on earth. Uh, in the UK, we've got 13, um, 14 native species of, out of a, a worldwide range of a uh, number of around two and a half thousand. We also have some um, of the Perchidae family in the Perch, Ruff and the Zander, and we have one of the Socidae family, which is, is the pike, and again, Pike, I'm, I'm sure you're all um, well aware of. Uh, but some of the, the sort of key features uh, that defines it makes a cyprinid a cyprinid. Uh, they don't have a stomach, um, they don't have any teeth, they have the toothless jaws, and they, 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 they crush the food items with some uh, referred to as pharyngeal teeth or throat teeth, which sit at the back and they're used for actually crushing. Um, and you can actually use these for, um, for identifying fish, which we'll touch on in a minute. Uh, and the cyprinids have a, a single dorsal fin, which is, is normally supported by uh, a series of soft rays, which again, um, we can use as an identifiable feature. And they have a very varied diet. Yeah, they, they'll, they'll eat a whole range of invertebrates and plants. Uh, so very, very um, diverse. So they can, it allows them to inhabit a whole range of, of different habitats. So just a little bit on um, how we can sort of use the, the environment and the habitat to actually help us to, to maybe identify some of the fish. Um, this is a classic piece of work done by Hewitt back in 1946, where he went to actually try and classify rivers um, into zones based on the, the, the fish that you find within each of these zones. Actually, in reality now, we, you know, we, we've, we've moved this on um, 70 or 80 years, and it's a little bit too simplistic for modern uh, river systems, yeah, but the, 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 a lot of the river systems have been heavily impacted, they've been modified over the years, and, and this doesn't quite work as, uh, as it did in, in Hewitt's time back in the 30s and 40s. <clears throat> but you can see here how you know, the, the rivers are broken down um, into the, these sort of five distinct zones, with the trout zone at the, at the headwaters, shallow, fast flowing, very clear water, highly oxygenated, um, quite a, a, requires quite a, a specialist fish to, 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 um, to survive and thrive up there. But as we start to move down, our fish populations change, move into that grayling zone, still quite fast flowing, but it starts to get a little bit more nutrients in there, the, 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 uh, the bed change, the substrate types change, you get a little bit of soil coming in, sand and silt. Um, uh, and then as we move further down, we, we come into the sort of the middle reaches. And you'll notice if you look at the, the, uh, the, the graph underneath, the oxygen levels start to fall, becomes a bit more meandering, the river, the river becomes a bit slower, there might be still areas, and it's perfect for, for species such as barbel, and then further down we, we come into the, the bream zone. And right at the bottom of our rivers where we've got this sort of estuary, this brackish water zone, and this is, is the, the, um, the habitat of species like the, the smelt um, and the flounder. But both of these species, smelt and flounder, will migrate up, up rivers, uh, and we find flounder, particularly where I live up in, in Hull, uh, the flounder move right up into the freshwater systems at certain times of year. So that by no means are they isolated to, the, to their particular areas. And you will catch, you know, and there's nothing to say you won't catch trout further down the river. They're not, you know, they're not solely uh, inhabitants of the very upper reaches. So these fish do, do merge slightly between the, um, between the river zones. So that was a bit of background. Now let's have a, a look at how we can actually, um, what we can actually use to identify the, the species that we're going to find on the, on the riverbank. And this is a really good picture of the sort of key identifiable features for fish. 
uh, and I borrowed this from uh, Mark Everard's excellent book on identifying fish with Britain's freshwater fish. So we've got a number of features, as you can see on there. If we start at the head, you've got the, the gill cover or the operculum, and, and that's, a, that's a, um, some of the elements there are used for particularly for identifying difference between salmonids. Uh, and then we've got things like the lateral line, and then we've got the whole range of, of fins. Um, the adipose fin is, is quite an interesting one. We use that as a, a, a real key um, identifiable feature of, of the salmon and the smelt families. Um, so if it's got an adipose fin, you very, very quickly can narrow it down to, a, to only sort of three or four species. Um, and then we've, we've, so we, we've got the, the dorsal fin, we've got the paired fins in the, uh, the, the pecs and the, and the pelvics. And then we've got the tail and you'll you'll start to see there's a, you know, as we move through these fish, each of these fish um, uh, are quite unique and they've got different um, fin numbers. They've got different fin shapes. They've got different fin spines and, and different arrays on them as well. So a really useful um, features as to, to, to help us you know, get to where we want to be with regards to identifying fish. So what can we what are we looking for? So fins. Yeah, number, shape, and ray counts, and we can look at the difference in each of those. And we'll, we'll what we say as we move on, we'll touch on those scales. Uh, have they got scales? Are there, are there missing scales, like in, in some of the loach species, uh, or, or have very few scattered scales, like some of the the um, the mirror carp species, the carp that we see that are bred out for without any scales. The lateral line is a, is a key feature. How many scales on the lateral line is, is one of the, the ones we often jump to when we're looking at trying to identify fish. We go straight into the lateral line scale count and each species of fish has a, a varied number that can help us again as a, a quick and easy way to, to get narrow it down. And, and mouth shape's a good one as well. How, what's the shape of the mouth? Has it got barbels? Has it got any teeth? And then we can look at the actual the morphology of the fish. Is it deep, slender, is it flattened, is it elongate? And again, this can help us to narrow it down very, very quickly into a, 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 a smaller number of fish. And that can, yeah, can save us trawling through a, a, a long list. Some of the more contentious things we can look at, maybe size. You know, we don't often use size uh, uh, because all fish start off small. You know? So when you're out in the field and you're doing any monitoring and, and you end up with a, a bucket of small silver fish, using size isn't going to really help um, and again we'll touch on that in, in a second and then also um, colour uh, so I've put this picture of the sticklebacks uh, in the bottom right hand corner there and you'll see that that bright red um, coloration in that male stickleback that's a, um, a, a breeding um, change or a, a, a coloration that that's shown in when the, the male sticklebacks are ready to breed. So we wouldn't use that as, you know, if you was going to describe a stickleback to somebody, you wouldn't say it has a bright red throat and underbelly, because that's not an identifiable feature that we can use all throughout the year. And the same applies to other species. Minnow do this as well. So it's, yeah, it, it's not one we often use. And unfortunately for us working as you know, in sort of fisheries, we often get called to fish kills. And if you get called to a fish kill and the fish have been dead for, a few days, they, they very quickly lose that coloration. So we need to look at, at other ways of being able to, um, to identify them. So another plug for the FSC, that's the field key to the freshwater fishes and lampreys of the British Isles on the left-hand side. That's the one we use. And when we run our fish ID courses, that's the one we give out to all of our trainees. It's an actual, it's a key. It's a, a, a good field key that you can use. If you're not, you're first with fish, you're not aware of, you can actually key them out. And if you want a good, everyday book to throw in your rucksack um, Mark Everard does a very very good book on these Britain's freshwater fishes um, and the beauty of that is it's got a waterproof cover as well so you can chuck it in your rucksack and you can take it out and it's got brilliant colour pictures of, of all the fish so if you, 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 know, you can key them out or you can have a look through the books and, and try and, and, and find them and there are dozens of ID books you know I've got a shelf full so the, you know, please do you know get yourself a couple of them and, and put them in your um, in your rucksack or in your car when you, you're out in the field so how do we tell them apart? So here's two of probably the most common cyprinid species. The roach certainly is, is, is probably the most common, um, one of the most common fish in, in, the, in the country. So you've got root at the top and the roach at the bottom. And you'll notice, as with most of the cyprinids, the, the silver-ish, um, and it's very, very easy to, to get them confused. Um, and what the pesky things do is they also hybridize freely. They the spawn at similar times, they spawn in similar areas and substrates. So we get a lot of, um, of hybrids, particularly between these two species. Um, 
So what we're looking for here is, is those key identifiable differences that allow us to, um, to make a quick assessment of the species. So the arrows and the lines on here are what, we, what we're looking for, really, when we're, we're, we've got two species in our hand and we want to be able to, to make a quick um, judgment on the species. So we mentioned about the lateral line. If you look at the lateral line, which is the, the, um, the arrow across the middle of the fish, yeah, lateral line scale count on a rud is between 40 and 45. And on a roach, it's between 42 and 45. So that's, you know, that there is some crossover there. Um, you look at the, the mouth is a, is a real key feature on rud. The, the rud have got this, this upturned or this superior mouth because they're actually a designed for or a surface feeder or a nibbling fish. Um, so if you look at the mouth and the, the, the bottom lip goes over the top, yeah, it, it, it's more than likely a rud. Um, you can look at the, the iris as that really deep gold color um, uh, uh, and rud, if they're particularly if they're they're, um, they're alive, some terrible thing to say. They have this gold sheen to the to the body, uh, and this really pronounced red um, coloration on the fins. But remember that the, the color can can distort slightly. Um, and one of the, the other ways is, is to look at the the um, location of the dorsal fin in relation to the um, to the pelvic fins. So if you look at the, the, the roach on the bottom, you'll see they're almost, the dorsal fin origin is almost above um, the, the pelvic fin origin. Whereas if you look at the rud on the top, the dorsal fin is set back and there's more of an angle between the two fins. That's a really good way to, um, to identify them quite quickly. But with all of these things, it's about getting your eye in and, and being, you know, being, uh, just seeing them side by side, which is always um, going to help. Right. So. This is where we, we muddy the water somewhat. So you can see on here, there's a whole list of, of potential hybrids. I'm not saying these are all common. Some of them are incredibly rare and you, you, do, you, you have to try really hard to find them. Um, so yeah, the, um, the, 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 those in yellow, uh, the ones that are highlighted in yellow, the hardest ones to, to actually uh, correctly identify. And we do see uh, the, um, the roach bream hybrids are really common. Some fisheries of, of uh, a real uh, high number of, of roach bream hybrids, and there's, there's issues and, and questions as to why that is. Um, roach rud is another one we, we see quite often. And one of, the, one of the other ones which we're going to touch on in a second is this one, the, the goldfish carp hybrid. Uh, we, we see those um, quite frequently where we, we have um, ornamental fish thrown in as well. So there's a whole list. Um, and, and this the other image on the left hand side is actually the pharyngeal teeth taken from a, a fish. I'll just go back um, a couple of slides. Sorry, I should have explained on here. This image at the top is the pharyngeal teeth from, uh, the, from a range of fish. And all of these features on, that we're talking about here are what we call non-destructive. So we can actually pick the fish up, put it in our hand and have a look at it. And it tells us what we're, we're looking for. Whereas you know, we pull out the pharyngeal teeth, they're in the back of the, the throat of the fish and it's quite a destructive method. But each of the, the fish have different um, pharyngeal teeth makeup. So bearing all that in mind, um, this is what I get sent a lot of. Um, lots of hands with lots of fish and, uh, and an email going, can you tell me, can you explain what this is, please, Paul? Not always particularly easy. Some of these are straightforward. Some of these are actually my hand I just put on to, to show you. But we do get sent lots of them, uh, and some of them are, are, are more difficult than others to, to identify. And they are good fun, though, and they're always good fun to share on Twitter um, and to send out to people and, and just send it out to the fish Twitter world and get their, their ideas as well. Um, but the one in the middle with the, the red circles round, we're going to remember that picture because if we get time at the end, we're going to come back to it. But that does, does it's really important that you, you learn to identify different fish and, and pick out the oddities. And that those two there are particularly important oddities that were missed in a fish survey that we, we were sent and we picked up on. So, yeah, I have a, a, a growing collection of hands holding fish, which is, um, uh, which is, it makes a good collage for your, for your office wall. So let's move on. So some common fish. Carp are probably, by far and away now, the most stocked fish into fresh waters in, in, in England, not so much so in, in, in Wales, Ireland or, or Scotland. Anglers love catching them. They're hardy, they grow quickly, um, they, they fight well and, and, and they do well at high densities. But they're not 
brilliant for ecology. So all you uh, sort of ecologists out there will appreciate this. You get a lot of carp in a pond. It becomes muddy quickly. You, you, your plants, your sensitive plants and your invertebrates go um, downhill very, very quickly. And you end up with a monoculture of single species. We do have another species of carp in, in, um, in the UK, which is the cruising carp. Uh, and these are a, a much finer species, much more delicate. Maximum size is sort of four or five pound. F feed completely differently to, to the, the common carp. Um, uh, and actually are a, a, a really useful species in a, you know, a sort of a more environmentally balanced pond, if you like. And if you look at this fish on, this, the, the, on, the, on the bottom left here, this is what happens when you hybridize um, carp and goldfish. This is a, a brown goldfish or a fantail goldfish. And you'll tell, you know, um, the, the difference in features is look at the shape of the tail, and the shape of the head, you know, the depth of the body, you know. So we do see these hybrid hybridize and carp and, and cruisers will uh, will hybridize and create those those sort of uh, oddities and so when we're looking at doing cruising carp projects we, we often try and get as many of the carp out as we can so we can keep the, the the genetic integrity of the of the stock but you can see why anglers like them because they do grow quite big and uh, that is the world record carp and um, that is 112 pounds um, and that was caught from a, a, a very famous lake in hungary called euro aqua um, the British record is 60, 68 pounds, so considerably less than that lump. Um, but with things like climate change and, and, and breeding and, and what have you, you know, these things are getting bigger and bigger and bigger year on year. So, you know, this is uh, not coming to a water near you anytime soon, I hope, but just show you what the sort of sizes they can get to. Um, so, yeah, some of the common species that are, are, are quite difficult now to tell apart, but with a few little identity, a few little tips. You can pick them out. This and chub, um, uh, uh, leuciscids, and do you know, do throw people, particularly as I say when they're when they're a bit smaller. Easiest feature to look for is the shape of the dorsal fin and the anal fin. So on this, um, the the anal fin, the dorsal fin and the anal fin um, are concave, and on chub uh, uh, they're not. So it's quite easy to to get them in your hand up, uh, extended the 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 fins. And have a very quick look. Um, with these two species, size is a good predictor as well. If it's much over a pound and a half, pound and three quarters, it's it's either the biggest dish you've ever seen, um, or it's a chub. Uh, I think the, the dace, uh, one pound four, one pound five is a big dace. Um, if you get anything and it's two pound, three pound, it's more than likely a chub. And if you can put your fist in its mouth, it's definitely a chub. Now, these things are proper. Um, munchers yeah, they'll, they'll take anything that they can fit in the mouth and, and just another one just another example another leuciscid is the is the eye um uh, and that eye that you'll look there you'll feel oh, that's not an eye it's an off well it is an off and and, and off and eyed are, are the same species the off the golden off is the ornamental version of, of the eye um, and an eye is another as say the, the silvery fish that we we often see and becoming more common in in um in fresh waters indeed the the British record for the Ide was eight is eight pound and uh, five, and it came from the River Hull. Uh, it's a joint British record came from the River the River Hull a few years ago, and we've got some really big fish um, milching around in the in the River Hull these days. Yeah, so bream and silver bream, two um, very similar species, but again with a little bit of, of um, inspection, quite easy to sell them apart. So you bream again with size, a big silver bream is is a pound. So once you start to get them two, three, four pound, then, then they're, they're almost certainly um, uh, the, the common bream the, or the bronze bream as anglers like to refer to them. But silver bream have very large scales uh, and, and not many of them on the lateral line. So sort of 44, 48 scales on the lateral line is a, is a silver bream. They're not massively common, but where you find them, you do find um, good numbers of them. And they tend to to appear in in, in shoals, and, and your uh, anglers will go out and catch a few in a yeah, in a day. Um, and the other fish, just as an example, on in, on the bottom right is a bleak, and these are a um, a very small silvery cyprinid that shoals surface feeders. You'll look at that overslung mouth, uh, sorry, underslung mouth, uh, and they they generally uh, you find them in massive shoals, particularly in the in the autumn, in the winter. 
um, and anglers will, will catch thousands of them in, in a short space of time and, and make up very, very big weights. But again, they're just another small silvery fish that you can um, often get confused with others. But yeah, again, with these uh, sizes, it, it, it is a good predictor of what it might be. Um, I mentioned in size, you'll see that again, another fish on a hand, that's a tiny barbel. Um, it's quite rare to find them to find them that small. Um, these are, barbel are an interesting species because they don't generally show to anglers till they get to sort of eight to 10 ounces. You, you don't find it, anglers don't catch them when they're, they're, they're generally, when they're, they're really small. Um, so we, we, know, we tend to find them in fish surveys and other things, but yeah, they're, they're, they're not something that, uh, they tend to disappear and, and inhabit different habitats. But it's difficult to make, get these confused. The tench is, is green, yeah, it's a bot bottom feed, it's quite distinct. There's nothing else really that, that looks like it. Generally really, really slimy, lots and lots of tiny, tiny, well embedded scales. And, and if you get them in, in nice clear water, they have this bright red eye. Barbel likewise, sets of barbels, very muscular, very streamlined, inhabits faster water. And then um, the angler's favourite at the bottom there, which is our native gudgeon. Um, a, a massive one is sort of three, four ounces, but really, really pretty looking fish, mottled, live on the bottom, um, like sand and gravel, and very difficult, again, to, to, uh, to, to confuse them with anything else, apart from maybe you know, if you, 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 you come across them and then they're mixed in with, with a similar size species, unless you see... A lot of anglers do often wonder what they've what they've caught if they come across them for the first time. So a little bit on the on the predators. Um, I would like to think it, it's it's difficult to to get this you know, get these confused. Um, maybe between a rough and a perch if you, if you don't see them very often. But a, a top tip to tell them apart with between the rough and the perch is you, you will see the arrow on the rough is they have this fused dorsal. So their first dorsal, which is their spiky. Um, aggressive looking dorsal is actually fused into their uh, into the second soft dorsal. So if you can see a clear gap, as you can quite nicely here on this perch, and you can nicely here on this zander, uh, then you know it's not a rough. If they're fused together, it's um, it's a rough. The, the rough, the perch, there's a perch and zander. They serve this this double dorsal. Um, perch have these almost tiger-like stripes develop on the flanks which if you catch them in really nice clear water can be often quite pronounced. Um, uh, and one of, the, uh, one of the features that obviously that tells a pike apart and, and, uh, is that all of their fins, uh, or the, 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 their dorsal, their anal fin, are towards the back. Uh, and that's because they are an ambush predator. Having all your fins that far back allows, you to, allows the fish to have maximum propulsion, short bursts of energy, and it, it allows them to, to tackle their prey. And if you were to look at the head of a pike, very very closely the eyes are full uh, eyes are on the top the face forward and they've got these little grooves under their eyes which people think that actually helps them to, to be able to orientate towards their prey and they've got a mouthful of uh, a mouthful of teeth um so yeah top predators ambush well well um well camouflaged perch uh, perch can be shellfish and you'll catch again large numbers of them um a pike not so much, not so they're generally um individuals um, think about Xander, they're a non-native species. Um, they're regulated under the Keeping and Introduction of Fish Act. I won't go into the um, intricacies of, of KIF legislation and what we should and shouldn't be doing with Xander. There's a whole other talk there. Um, but where you find them, they can become very problematic. They, they, they are very, very um, predatory. They're, they're like small cyprinids. They can cause you know, uh, sharp declines in, in certain situations, particularly look at some of the midland canals have been heavily impacted by numbers of zander but as i say that's a talk for another day uh, around the impacts of, of, of zander that's a big one and and then so sort of the, the mini species they're often referred to as the minor species which i think is a, is a bit dismissive um they're quite cute pretty cool you know uh, everybody likes likes a stickleback and often the the first um experience people have of, of fish is a is a net and a a, a, a jam jar and a, a three span stickleback which you take home and put in a, a slightly larger jar and, and you end up with um you know a, a couple of pet sticklebacks for a few days but we've got um a number of these the three span stickleback 10 span stickleback we've got the stone lurch you've got the minnow in the, in the top right there and, you, and you've got the bullhead really important species 
uh, the, the, uh, an absolute key of the sort of uh, the aquatic ecosystem in the, in the food chain. Minnows uh, are eaten by a number of species. Bullheads are actually uh, tiny predators of, in their own right. And so they are, you know, they are a key species here. I'm sure you all know about sticklebacks. I showed you the picture of the red, the, the male earlier. They're a nest guy, they're a nest building fish. And it's actually the males that, um, that build the nests. They have a, a secretion out of the kidneys, like a, a, a sticky secretion that builds the nest. They then do this bizarre zigzagging dance to, to draw in a, a female. The female lays her eggs and then the male actually shoes her away. That, that, that's the, the, the female's job here is simply to be attracted, lay her eggs. The male fertilizes the eggs and that's as far as the, the, the parental content, concern for the, for the female is, is. That's it. The male shoes her away and the male, it's the male who actually guards the eggs and, and actually guards the, the fry for the first couple of days before they become big enough. So, yeah, it's quite a unique sort of um, behaviour for uh, in fish, um, but very important. So, salmonids, again, the, an, another whole group of fish. Um, we're going to touch on salmonids in, in, in a bit more in a second, so I won't um, sort of major on this, but this is your, your sort of Species we're looking for, you've got brown trout, you've got sea trout, you've got a rainbow trout, which is a, an introduced species from North America for very popular with angling. Odd populations in rivers now, is there the, there's one in the, uh, the Derbyshire, why Derbyshire Derwent's got a pop, an established population of rainbow trout. Um, uh, and then we've got the Atlantic salmon. Um, and they are, they vary massively between rivers, between parts of rivers, between catchments, between streams. The different colorations and shapes and things are, are, are quite interesting when you look at you look at brown trout. So yeah, there, uh, I'll talk about so there's, there's there's ways of, of being able to identify them and, and tell the difference. So there's different distinct colorations, as I say, in, in in trout between catchments, and then you've got sort of salmon, juvenile salmon as well, salmon par, uh, sort of muddy in the water when you you start to look at them, and and this picture here on in the bottom left is is a, a really easy key to to point out some of the key features this is from the the atlantic salmon trust um, and you can see if you look at the, the trout on the top and then if you look at the, the fish on the bottom right you'll be able to maybe make a guess as to to which are trout and uh, i've just said trout on the top the two fish on the top and the fish on the bottom and using the guide you might be able to make a bit of a guess as to which one's trout and which one the, um, is the salmon part and I'll, uh, I'll leave that for you to, to have a think about and we'll, we'll come back to salmon in a, in a second. So, yeah, there's lots of lots of identifiable features, as I say. And, and if you are interested and you want the guide, please do do shout and I can uh, I can send you it over because it, it is quite useful. Um, just to just to flag these, these are um, Pacific salmon. Uh, and we've, we've seen these, the, the, the uh, sorry, the Pacific salmon species, the pink salmon. Uh, and we've seen these turning up on, on the British coast um, uh, over the last couple of years. So, yeah, again, just to, another species to be um, to be aware of. Uh, and that's quite interesting. But I'm sure you know, anybody wants any more information, then please do um, give me a shout on those. Um, and then uh, uh, there's a raft of other species that are, are of particular interest to us. The, the, the lampreys, we've got three species of lamprey, two species of shad. Got a number of white fish species, the corrigonids, and we've got a, a, a population of Arctic char in certain waters as well. So these are all really um, important key species for for us. And again, you know, these are conservation species that will um, are quite important. So just to to touch on some of the other species we've come across then. So we've got the um, the migratory species. We've got the um, the smelt, the river lamprey, with the sea trout we've talked about, we've got the eel, uh, which one of my particular favourite species, the Atlantic salmon, uh, and then we've got the, the, the shad species. And then this, uh, this curious looking beast in the, in the bottom there is a, is a sea lamprey, uh, and these are um, of a unique life cycle and are really quite, um, quite interesting and intriguing when you, you look at them. The, 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 they would scare your children, I think, if you saw saw a big one and it was a, it was in your hand. But again, we can we can touch on that in a bit. So these species have um, what are called diadromous life cycles, and depending on the on the species, they do different things. So the um, the anadromous, anadromous life cycle um, 
is we 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 have a number of species that that demonstrate this. So the the adults um, they, they they migrate upstream to spawn. They spawn in the river. The juveniles grow in the river. Then they migrate downstream and then do the majority of their growing at sea. And that's those species are the um, the, the salmon, the, the sea trout, the shad, um, uh, and the river and sea lamprey. And then we have the the reverse, the catadromous life cycle, where they're actually born in the sea. And then they, they do their growth in the river. And the only catadromous species we have in, in the UK is the, um, is the European eel. Um, I won't go through this in, in, in too great detail, so I'm sure you, you, you've maybe seen this before. But the, the adults have this, um, this, this sort of migration where they from the, from the UK, they head north and there's a, they're spread out depending on where they, they actually come from. Um, but they come back into our rivers, they migrate up, up the rivers. They, they hang around and then they actually spawn in between November and January, depending on where they are. <clears throat> and then their juveniles sort of develop and grow, um, live in the river for a, a, a number of years, depending on whereabouts they are and how, how warm it is, how much food availability there is. And then they, they go through this smultification process and then they migrate downstream and then go out to sea and they say go to these, these feeding grounds in the um, in the North Atlantic, um, and then again can stay there for any number of years before they they head back to to fresh water again. The thing with salmon, of course, is that they they're home to their natal river, so they'll actually come back to the river in which they were they were spawned in, and so you get that that genetic. Um, uh, so the the, 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 yeah, the the those fish are genetically unique to those to those catchments generally, or you'll get the odd fish that that does stray. Um, and the reverse of that is this catadromous life cycle that we see with the um, with the eel. Now, if anybody's followed any of the work on eels over the past few years, the, uh, you know, you'll know the sort of um, the, the life cycle and the extremes to which eels go through. Um, there's this mass migration out from the rivers in th down through into the uh, to the Sargasso Sea, go through this spawning process that nobody has ever witnessed. Uh, there's there's no witness. We, we have a guess at how they spawn. Um, and then they, they develop into these tiny little leaf um, shaped leptocephalus, which then drift um, on ocean currents um, and, and, and come back using the ocean currents into the, into the um, North Africa and African and, and European coast where they spread out. There's no homing. They're, they're not going to their natal rivers. It's just you know, the, the look of the drift, if you like, is, is, is to where they, where they land. And then they, they sort of go through another phase into this, this glass eel stage, which is when they, they get caught in big numbers, um, particularly around the Bay of Biscay, uh, uh, and then it used to be a fishery in the Severn, uh, commercial fishery. And then they, they again, they, might, they change, metamorphosis again into these yellow brown eels, um, and then live their, their lives out in, in the, the, the rest of their lives in the fresh water until they get to that point where they, they choose to, to migrate and they turn around and they uh, they head off back to the Sargasso again, and that's it. You know, they get to the Sargasso, and they um, uh, they, they spawn, and then they die. We don't get any returning adults at all. But we do get these. Uh, I think this is really quite interesting. I put this in as a, a bit of a um, a talking point. Not all eels are the same, um, and and I, the, this eel here in the bottom left was was one that that sparked these the, the, these other pictures to appear. This was caught on the River Ribble uh, on one of their surveys last year. And I sent this to a few eel um, friends and they sent back all these other pictures going, yeah, yeah, we come across them, but they are quite rare. Um, so you've got white eels, you've got these yellow eels, you've got these mottled eels. And, and the one in the middle is actually a, a melanistic eel. It's completely black and they're, they're very, very rare. Uh, and one of the people we work with said they have to go through about 100,000 eels to find one yellow one. So they're quite rare, quite unique. So, yeah, they are... Um, yeah, if you find one, yeah, please take a picture because you, you found something quite special. Right, just to to um, to wrap this up, something different. So we do see these unusual species every now and again, and with things like climate change and with releases from the ornamental trade and garden centers and things, we get these oddities. And it's really important that we notice them. There are a whole raft of them. We're going to have a quick whistle stop tour of them here, but you must notice them if there's anything you're not sure of make sure you take a picture and alert somebody the environment agency or your local rivers trust or your wildlife trust so we really you know we need to get in our handle on where these um where these fish are um Thomas Goodgen 
is one such fish, um, was brought in again as an ornamental fish um, a, a few years ago um, and has, has started to appear in the, um, or started to appear several years ago in, in the wild. And they are a pest. Yeah, they eat everything, they outcompete very, very quickly. They're incredibly um, good spawners. They grow very, very quickly and they breed very, very early. So we get this, um, uh, this almost constant biomass of, of topmouth gudgeon and we try to eradicate them and this is what they look like and this picture here in the middle you can actually see them within the mouth of this fish they're yeah, juvenile fish live uh, that is these uh, are hiding if you like within the, the mouth of the uh, of the fish uh, and it's really care so, yeah, really careful when you're moving fish between waters that were that have got top mouth gudgeon that we're aware of them and um, another one is the motherless minnow it's another non-native species, really small fish, very large production, uh, reproductive potential. But a key feature to identify here is the incomplete lateral line. The, the arrow is, is pointing to the lateral line, nine or ten dark paws at the head of the fish, and that's it. And that's a really quick way to, to tell them apart. And again, if you do want to, to look them up, to have a look at um, identifying them in the field, my colleague Ian Welby has put together this really um, useful guide and again I can send this out to people but it's this here that we're looking at is a really quick way this this these four to ten scales along the the, the, the that is the lateral line incomplete um, and um, it's a quick way in the field to, to identify them and you can tell them the difference between those and, and our other native species particularly our native bleak the, 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 the no relation to them and again here's that picture I was talking about so that they were all identified as carp when in reality, those two rather mangled looking sorry fellows at the bottom are some bleak. And they were found in a fish kill. So if they hadn't somebody had some eagle eyed um, person had gone, well, actually, I don't think that's right, and sent it to, to us, then you know, that population could have been allowed to, um, to, to, to flourish and to carry on. But as it was, we, we spotted it and we um, yeah, was able to do something about it. Um, Bitterlin, again, another species that's come from the ornamental trade. I've put these in because they're quite cool. They're, um, they're actually native to, to Central and Eastern Europe, but their breeding strategy is, is, is pretty clever. Um, they tend, generally tend to spawn in, in the spring. The males change colour, become very, very bright. They lay their eggs in mussels, in freshwater mussels. Um, and so the male draws a female in around the mussel that he's chosen as his uh, the place to deposit the eggs and then the um the female deposits the eggs into the, the cavity of the mussel via its, its siphon its tube and then the the male does exactly the same thing um uh, 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 and releases its its sperm into the area of the mussel which then draws the sperm into the with the eggs the eggs mature and hatch within the mussel and actually escape through the siphon tube and back into the water so really uh, a really um cool sort of um breeding strategy that protects the eggs and and the young from from predation so as, again but they are a non-native species and we are you know we are trying to do our best to, to keep them under control if we can just purely for to be awareness the bear but was the last uk fish to go extinct sometime in the, in the 70s but we are looking at a, 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 a reintroduction program, and there's a few Norfolk Wildlife Trust are looking at one. There's, there's some work being done by, hopefully, going to be done by Essex University and partners looking at this as well. So this is one that we might see coming back with a with a bit of luck. Right then, so I'm just going to rattle through a few of these. Well, catfish, yeah, these are another one. Shouldn't be in our rivers. Do get released from garden ponds, can grow massive in the right environment. This one up here is 200 pounds plus. But that's from the, the River Ebro. Um, they don't, they're not going to get that big in England just yet, hopefully. Um, we'll just move on from the, the sturgeon. Um, these are in, an interesting one to, to keep an eye on is the stalets. They've been, again, your fan is tearing up in rivers. A lot of these come from the garden centers. Um, they've been thrown into fisheries illegally. Um, in a lot of instances, and they can grow quite quite large. There's, there's one I caught a few years ago. So we do we do find them. We, we've had people you know, reporting them from um, being caught from rivers as well now. So yeah, another species to be aware of, and they shouldn't be going back if you um, if you do catch them. They are a, uh, they, they could cause particular problems if they, they they get out of out of hand. But this is some work 
we've been involved with um, through the um, Sturgeon and Trust. So we've 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 started started this the UK Sturgeon Alliance in the last couple of years, and it's trying to recover the sturgeon into the uh, the native sturgeon into the um, into UK waters. The largest rod caught fish was a sturgeon, four hundred and three pounds. Um, I'm sorry, four hundred and fourteen pounds caught way back in 1903. So. We might get some rod bending action if we can um, we can get these back, but they're a, we're a long way off from getting fish of that size, unfortunately. Right, the oddities then, and this is what we get sent. Get a few of these. So the, uh, the, the the odd catfish, which has been chucked into into a canal from a um, from an ornamental system. Here yeah, we get um, this black uh, sort of bullhead um, type catfish, an armored catfish. That was in a canal. That makes that picture makes the fish look enormous. But if you actually think about it, it's on a four-inch gate post. So it's just the aspect of the um, uh, of the picture. That's a, a placostomus type catfish. And then we get things like this. That's a snakehead. And if you know anything about snakehead, they're a tropical warm water species. They flourish in places like Florida. And this chap tried to tell us that he caught it from the river with them in January. And you can tell the, the amount of clothing he's wearing. He isn't in a tropical um, environment. So the likelihood is he found it on the bank and thought he'd try and pull a fast one. Um, so yeah, snakeheads, incredibly vicious, need to be kept under license, but are unlikely to survive in English waters at the minute. Thank you very much. Um, and then we get these. So we think the, the fish on the left is a weather lurch, turned up in a fish sample. Again, another thing that fish that's probably been thrown out of a, an ornamental um, Pond, and then the fish on the right, answers on a postcard, please, because we weren't quite sure, and we're still not quite sure what it is. It's one that's thrown us for a number of years. It was caught a few years ago. We've all had a look at it. Quite a few people have had a look at it, and we can't come up with a, a clear um, a clear suggestion as to what it might be. So any ideas, um, greatly received. And then just to finish, um, this creature turned up. Um, on the banks of a canal in Birmingham last year. That's an alligator gar. Um, it look again, the way the picture's been taken makes it scarier than it is, but it was about two foot long. And that's been that's come from somebody's tank and they put it into either found it or put it on the side of the canal for a laugh, thinking of getting the paper, which they did, or they've, they've released it because it's too big for their tank at home. But you only have to look at the head of that thing to realize how much of a, a top predator it is in the um, and the trouble it could cause to local fish populations. Um, so, yeah, so with that um, frightening discovery, I shall um, say thank you very much. And, yeah, any questions? Thanks very much, Paul. Fascinating talk. Really, really interesting. Loads of questions. So if anybody would like to ask a question in person, I suggest you raise your hand using the... Um, using the raise hand feature under participants. Uh, I'm going to allow, there we go. Right, Paul, if it's okay with you, we might rattle through some quick questions first and then I might pick one or two from the, the that might be a bit longer. Is that okay? Yeah, 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 fine, please do. All right, so. I'll put my camera on, sorry, there you yeah. go. Quick, are you ready for the quick fire round, the quick fire fish? Yeah, shot? let's go. Right, your first image, were they shad? Oh, the, the very first one. Yeah. No, no, that was a that's a PowerPoint um, slide that they, I put fish into PowerPoint, and it it, it kind of gave me that nice swirly pattern. So I thought that would be a would be a good one. So okay. no, un, uh, unidentified speech probably looked like scomboid of some description. So they're nondescript fish. They're just fish. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so from the same person, Mark, uh, are shad, coarse or salmonids? Um, the shad, it, uh, uh, you classify them as a as a coarse fish. They're not salmonids. They're 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 a loss of species. So there are there are two species on all on their own. Um, so they're they're a loss of phalaxa and a loss of lossa. So they're yeah they're a, they're a species all of you know, they're not grouped into either of those species. All right, okay. Those, in those groups, sorry. Um, you mentioned flounder in the upper reaches. Is that adults or juveniles or both? And that's well, I, you'll, you'll find adults. We we catch them regularly coming up, up coming up the river. So uh, same with with smelt as well. Smelt are used 
um, sort of tidal transport to, to migrate up rivers to spawn. So if any of you are in the in the Thames, um, you regularly find uh, smelt and flounder uh, right up the Thames. We, we do fish surveys um, outside of Tate Modern, opposite St Paul's, and we find flou flounder and smelt there. Okay. So you talked about two ID books. Do any of them cover juvenile fish? And if not, is there anything out there for juvenile fish? No, food? juveniles are the absolute bane of a fish biologist's life. There is a very, very good book. It's a very old book written by um, Adrian, Adrian Pinder a few years ago, which is about juvenile fish. And, and we're talking small fish. Um, there, there, there isn't really a, a, a brilliant guide I'm aware of apart from that one. That's the Environment Agency guide. Okay. Uh, Richie would like to know why are there no coarse fish mostly in rivers in Scotland? Just, just, just a, um, kind of, it's a climate driven thing. It's also um, a, a river suitability that not a lot of the rivers are particularly brilliant for, for coarse fish to inhabit. They are increasing in number as, as the rivers start to warm. You now we've got good numbers of, of roach in certain rivers, got good numbers of chub in some of the rivers and carp, carp being carp are starting to, to show up. So it's just a, um, a climate thing that we're, we're going to see, you know, certainly going to see that change over the, the next few years. Yeah, so when you were going through carp, speaking of carp, Graham had asked what about grass carp and John off the back of that as Another question that I think we can link the two is which carp are actually native species? So can we just which ones are native, which ones are not, and which uh, ones right. are not willing to make? If there's it? anybody from Natural England listening, I'm going to throw throw the question out to them. Um, the only native species of carp is is the Crucian carp. However, there is now a bit of conjecture as to whether or not a Crucian carp is a native species and whether or not they were brought over. Um, prior to the last ice, uh, after the last ice age, which which muddies the water somewhat, and that was just really you know, that sort of information came out last year. But cruising carp are, to all intents and purposes, our only native uh, carp species, even though they're not true um, king carp. Common carp, I'm sure we all know about common carp being brought over by the Romans, etc., and then found by the monks, and the grass carp were brought over. Um, again, as a um, with it, this this idea that they would be able to control aquatic plants, and they don't really. It's not warm enough for them to really get a munch on for for aquatic plants in the UK, and you need a lot of them. So they're in, they're a non-native introduced species, and we don't have any of the other carp that you might see on on the TV, the Siamese carp and the, the, and the things like that. They're, they're, they're not over here. Yeah, so uh, Mandy would like to know, does smelt hybridise with anything else? Nope. Nope, that's a quick one. There's a, a, good, a, a good point on smelt, if you ever, uh, uh, which I should have um, said a bit more on, if you pull out a net and you can smell cucumber, you have caught smelt. One of their identifiable features is they smell strongly of cucumber. Uh, and you'll often hear people refer to them as cucumber smelt. Well, do they smell of cucumber or do cucumbers smell of smelt? <laughs> There's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Mary has asked, are terms like fry, par, smelt, etc., specific to salmon life stages, or are they used more general for other no, so, sal or fish? Salmonids go through those distinct stages. Yeah. So you get fry, par, the smelt, and 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 um, um, trout as well. Yeah, so sea trout are an ocean going or a marine phase of a, of a, a brown trout. They go through a similar process. With most fish, coarse fish, it's eggs, fry, juvenile, if you like, adult. They don't go through that several stages of, of, of development, which again is, is gearing them up for, for migration out to, out to sea. Yeah, so George has asked what is potodromus? Potadromus is another, it's another way of describing it's an, a, a, another way of describing a migratory style. So potadromus, anadromus, catadromus—they're all within within that. So they're different forms of, of migration. 
Okay, right. I'll just pick out another couple of quick ones and then we'll have to wrap it up, I'm afraid, everybody, because there's so many questions and I haven't even looked at the questions that have been flying in since um, since I started reading these out. So Gareth would like to know, if you catch one of these oddity fish, what should you do? Do you need to kill it before you report it? Right. This is this is where we, again, we've, we've got a little bit of a, a grey area. So a non-native species, you should hold it so if you catch a, a top mouth gudgeon it's three inches long a motherless minnow two you know if you've got ways and means of holding onto that fish hold on to it put it in a bucket give it a bit of aeration and, and hold on to it if you're certain it, it is what it is then give the environment agency a ring and there's a, a there's an 0845 number for the environment agency hotline um if not please take lots and lots of pictures head tails fin body as clear as you can so that we you can send them in and we can identify them later on yeah brilliant right um so i'm going to pick out last couple that i think we just need to quickly ask if you catch no that's the same question what am i doing uh phil would like to just seek some clarification is eye position a useful id feature um, a lot of our a lot of our fish, particularly coarse fish, the, their eyes are, are front and center, they're facing forward. Yeah, um, so not really. Pike, as I mentioned, you know they've they've got these sort of eye grooves that are like you know, helps them to home in on on predators. Um, the only other the only other one with any variation, I suppose, would be species like flounder, where you've got that there are there are flounder are a right eye migrating flatfish. So when they're juveniles they're the right way up then their right eye migrates which turns their body over so that's yeah that's, fascinating. that's the only things we've got that are slightly right. different and just to really test you we're going to end with mussels <laughs> oh god um, mary would like to know does the mussel survive benefit or lose from the relationship that it has with the bitterling right the mussel survives absolutely i don't think there's there's any benefit to the to the mussel per se but Pale mussels have um, have a have a relationship with salmonids, where the mussel benefits. So what the mussel does is, when the mussel spawns, it releases its its um, its eggs and it's spilled into the water, and and these then get insisted on the gills. They're called glossidia, and they insist on the gills of the trout, and the the trout carries them around. The, 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 um, the, the, the eggs mature, they hatch from the gills of the fish. The fish isn't compromised and the mussels then drop off and then drop into the, into the, the, uh, into the sediment and mature there. So there's no, uh, there's no impact on the trout or the, the, whatever fish might be and there's massive benefits for the mussels. So the, what the bitterling might compromise, the, the, the trout is a benefit. So the muscle, the it's not, it's not a one-way thing. Where no, 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 the, the muscle gets its own back on a different fish. Right, all right. Well, I think that's all we've got time for. We have went over a little bit with the questions. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to Paul.